Are you ready for adventure and financial education? Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Join the Real Estate Guys radio show for the 15th annual Investor Summit. Returning this year are sales legend Tom Hopkins, international developer Beth Clifford, attorney Mauricio Raoul, and the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. And new for this year, come meet Buck Joffrey from the Wealth Formula podcast. Plus, joining us live and in person for his fifth Investor Summit, the incomparable Peter Schiff. Peter is one of the few people who called the mortgage meltdown in writing before it happened. So come and find out how you can be prepared for the next economic shift. It all begins April 1st in Houston, Texas. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click on the tab that says Summit to learn more. Or call 888-GUYS-RADIO to talk with our Summit specialist. Spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, Buck Joffrey, and an all-star faculty in the 15th Annual Investors Summit at Sea. You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everyone. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. I had a really interesting week. As you know, I launched my book, Seven Secrets of Eternal Wealth, a week or so ago, and it became an international bestseller. And I also got invited, believe it or not, to appear on seven or eight TV shows to talk about the book. So that should be interesting. I'm excited to get out our message to more people. So thanks to those who bought the book. It is 99 cents and worth every penny. And especially to those who wrote a nice review about it. Thanks, guys. So by the way, if you like what I'm doing, please do share it with others. I'm not just talking about the book, but in general, I mean, the podcast here, this thing is growing really fast. And in January, we were up to 10,000 downloads, which you know, for a podcast that's only about seven months old, that's pretty good, I think. I'm happy that there's a lot of people out there that are listening and getting something out of this. But we got to share it, right? So share it with your friends. And, you know, I send out notifications via social media. And if you can, try to connect with me on social media. You can friend me. Still, I don't have enough friends to be followed, I think. So you can friend me at Buck Joffrey. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. And, of course, Twitter, where you can find me with at Buck Joffrey. But sharing the show is important. Getting our message out is important. And it's important to our colleagues and our friends who we, we don't want to see them dying broke either. So please do that. Now, if you have not done so, please also uh, consider signing up for our newsletter at wealthformula.com. And if you're an accredited investor, you should absolutely be enrolled in Investor Club. Now, what is uh, as a reminder, what is an accredited investor? It's not something that is designated by mean, the SEC says that you are an accredited investor if you make $200,000 per year or $300,000 if filing jointly or if you have a net worth of at least $1 million outside of your personal home. So that's what an accredited investor is. You either are one or you're not one. But if you are one, you should be on Investor Club. You know, this podcast is where you learn. You know, this podcast, along with the others out there and the books that you read, this is where you learn. Investor Club is where you can turn these concepts into action. Now, we've had two offerings so far, including ATM funds and a luxury hotel opportunity in Belize that I'm offering. And if you want to know more about these and you are an accredited investor, please join the club and we can talk to you about that a little bit more. Now, for those of you who are not accredited investors, this show does not leave you behind. Hopefully, you've noticed that. We've presented a number of opportunities on this show that where you can participate without having such designation, you know, not having all that money. In fact, our new sponsor, American Home Preservation, which buys non-performing mortgages and keeps people in their homes by renting them out back to the owners who are getting foreclosed on at a price they can afford. They're one of them. This is a fund that you don't have to be a credit investor. In fact, you can be involved for just a few hundred bucks. Now, I will tell you that I have invested literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in this fund over the past few years. And, you know, it's a very much a feel good business model, right? Keeping people in their homes, but it also really feels good to get a monthly check at 12%. So even if you're heartless, this is for you. And you can find out more about them at ahpfunding.com. That's ahpfunding.com. And you can also get a free copy of George Newberry's 
book, Burn Zones, delivered to your door by going to wealthformula.com and clicking on Burn Zones icon. And I will tell you, this is a story that every real estate investor must read. You know, everybody wants to tell you the great things about being a real estate investor. Well, this one tells you about some of the bad things that can happen as well when you start to really scale and you try to do things and you get a little cocky and it's really, really important work. And George has been nice enough to offer a free copy to our readers that he will have shipped to your door if you click on that icon. Now, today's show is another opportunity open to non-accredited investors. You don't have to have a ton of money. David Sewell, who was previously on my show to talk about his turnkey business in Panama, where you can literally buy coffee farms for long-term cash flow, is on again. Now, that show that we did was a great hit, and many of you actually bought land out there in Panama, and I hear it's going very, very well. David is a really smart guy, but he's also got a great heart. He's doing things out there that are helping the local indigenous populations. And he has a really interesting new opportunity about which you will be some of the first people to hear. In fact, we recorded this show a couple of weeks ago and David was not ready to actually have me send it out yet. So we agreed that we would have it this first week in February. And, you know, I would jump on this opportunity if you're interested, because it's very limited. Listen, investing in coffee, you know, which is his other business is very interesting because there's an abundance of coffee drinkers around the world and it's a growing market. And it also helps that it's a totally addictive drug, right? Caffeine. When you think about things that are not going away in the next 20 years, it's safe to say that coffee is one of them. What else is here to stay? Well, I bet you chocolate will be around for a long, long time. The market is growing at a tremendous pace and who doesn't love chocolate? Now that's an easy one to understand, right? My three little girls alone could keep that industry around for at least one more generation. So when we come back, David Sewell will tell us how you too can make money by owning a chocolate farm. I was having a lot of sinus infections. My sinuses were clogged, pressure, headaches. That's Karen. She suffered for years with chronic sinus infections. You don't feel like doing anything. When you feel like your head is completely clogged and the pressure uh, is just, it, it's just not fun. Always walking around with a headache. Now, her issues are gone. How? A minimally invasive procedure done in the office called the smart sinus procedure. I really did not know what it was like to feel like you're really breathing breathing and not being so clogged up. I would do it again in a heartbeat and I would definitely recommend it for someone else. Do you suffer with chronic sinus infections, facial pain, pressure, headaches? Find out if the Smart Sinus Procedure is right for you. Set an appointment today with Smart Sinus. Call 847-969-5000. 847-969-5000. 847-969-5000. Or visit SmartSinus.com. That's SmartSinus.com. Welcome back, everybody. Today, my guest is David Sewell. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because he's been on the show before. He was the founder of International Coffee Farms. And this business allows individuals to buy turnkey coffee farms in Panama. We talked about this business back in episode 19 of Wealth Formula podcast, and that generated a lot of interest. So we've got him back talking about something new and exciting. But as a reminder, he is a serial entrepreneur. He has an extensive background in private equity and venture capital. And in recent years, he's focused on Latin American opportunities, including coffee. But today, he's here to tell us about some new, exciting opportunities that are completely unrelated. So welcome back, David. Thank you very much, Buck. Pleasure to be here. So tell me, how are things going with those coffee farms? I know a number of our listeners have, have contacted you and been very excited about the opportunity. Things are going very, very well in the specialty coffee business here in Panama. Very pleased to say over the last uh, couple of years and since we last spoke with you, I think in September, we've acquired two or three more farms. We now have a total of nine farms either in production or being planted to be in production and turned around and developed into new farms. We're harvesting this year for our second time. The crop this year is coming along very, very nicely and will at least be double the amount of coffee we produced last year, probably a bit more than double. Things are going very nicely. Uh, we have been able to conclude our negotiations with the government here to be able to provide individual deeds 
to the parcel owners for their ownership to guarantee their security and the ownership of the land. And that was a moderately difficult process that had not been done before in the form we're doing it. And there had been a number of changes in the government's uh, approach to know your client here in Panama as a result of Panama papers and things like that. So we got all that done and we issued deeds to the first farm group quite some time ago. The second farm group is just having their deeds issued as we speak. And we should be finished and caught up with all of that process sometime in the first half of next year. So farming's in good shape. Coffee's in good shape. Coffee prices are good. We sold all of our coffee last year, 100% of it, to buyers that paid us 94% of what we had projected in our pro forma financials uh, two years earlier. Wow. We were sort of using basic information from the farming industry here in Bocchetti, but we we're really pleased to have come in with that. I'm sorry, so 94%. You projected that out two years from now and you got it now? Two years ago, we made projections as to what we were going to do. Right. We had our first distribution, which is now. Uh, We just, we did it in August and September. And amount of coffee we were going to grow and the amount of dollars we were going to be paid per pound was a forecast. I see. uh, Guesstimate. And based on industry stats from here and in reality, in actuality, we came within 94%. We were at 94% of that guesstimated number. Yeah, that's pretty good for a performer. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about the new opportunity. Well, we're continuing on with the what's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it concept. And we have pioneered in Colombia and, and, and developed here in Panama the specialty agricultural business of buying underperforming commercial farms and subdividing those into small half acre parcels and then allowing individual owners uh, to own a parcel or more in, in those farms. We're continuing on with that business model, sustainable income from offshore sustainable agriculture. And this time, we've branched out to cacao, which is the basic ingredient in chocolate. So we can just call it coffee, and now we can call this chocolate investing, <laughs> if you want to sum it up. Yeah. $98 billion industry in the world. Big, a lot bigger than most people think. Very well established, obviously, pretty well. Everybody likes chocolate. Gourmet chocolate's where we're going. And gourmet chocolate, like specialty coffee, is catching on worldwide, has high value added margins associated with it, high demand, ridiculously low supply, especially in cacao. Wow. And gourmet, fine flavored organic cacao, which is where we're going in a specialty, it's so underdeveloped that it's almost criminal. Yeah. And really, when you look at it, the poor country of Belize has some of the world's best cacao. Really? And they have not the ability to get it together. So why Belize, you know, along that line specifically? Well, uh, Belize is a, a stable place. It's, it used to be the British Honduras. I'm pretty sure all your listeners will know that. Yeah. Governed mm-hmm. by the Brits forever and ever and ever, colonized by them. Uh, became independent in 1984. It's got a solid democracy in place and everything's running nicely. It's British common law. So it's very familiar to all of us, even more so familiar than the Napoleonic law we have here in Panama. So it's an easy place to do business. It's uh, easily to, easy to travel to. It's English speaking, good banking system, good government systems, great people, people very, very willing to you know, float their boat if they could just figure out how to do it and uh, have some capital applied to it. So it's a great place to geographically diversify with our parcel owners in the same proven business model, but a different mm-hmm. geography, a different product, but the same fundamentals behind that product of high and increasing demand and ridiculously low supply. In the news today, a very interesting thing to further solidify this Belize thing is 72% of the world's commercial cacao comes from Ivory Coast and Niger and Nigeria. And Ivory Coast right now, yeah. as of the last 24 hours, has got a mutiny going on over there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's not at all that good for shipping product out of your country. Sure, um, sure. So 72% of that stuff you know it gets worse over there that can be dried up and if it dries up prices will just be through the roof yeah. uh, pricing is already very strong in cacao anyway but that's a good example of why not ivory coast and why not commercial cacao from them and why specialty cacao and why belize yeah and we've talked about belize on this show in the context of mahogany bay which is one of the projects i'm sponsoring as well 
and raising money for that with our investors. And so we've talked a lot about some of these advantages, specifically with regard to Belize, including the fact that, you know, there's a it's an English speaking country, which makes it a lot easier. You know, very, very stable government. There's never been a bank failure and the tourism every year is sort of off the charts in growth. So it really makes a lot of sense. And particularly if there's a great opportunity like this in the context of parallel geopolitical problems that might stunt the growth of your competitor. <laughs> so yeah, it's a good for sure. And, and with mahogany chocolate, which is one of the divisions or one of the groups of the Belize Cacao Consortium, as we call this deal, or this business, there's multiple revenue streams. One comes from obviously from the farming side, which is uh, the same that we've done here in coffee. The other two come from actually buying and selling and trading of cacao. Right. Uh, there's a f- huge opportunity to not only grow our own cacao beans and use those internally and sell them externally, but there's also an opportunity to trade in, in the cacao business just with the farmers that are there now that have real no have no real access to the market. There have been a couple of NGOs in place recently, both of which have cratered more or less in, the, in their ability to be able to buy and sell and trade cacao beans to help the, the subsistence farmers get to market. So on top of our own farming and our own beans, and there's the bean trading business. And as you just mentioned, there's a Mahogany Bay Village, and that's the third revenue stream that comes along with this offering, is that we'll have a company called Mahogany Chocolate in the downtown village of Mahogany Bay, which is, of course, branded a curio collection by Hilton Resorts. So it'll be the first four-star resort in Belize and a Hilton. And we have the exclusive right to supply them their pillow truffles, Nice. Uh, to all 305 rooms uh, every night, 365 days a year in perpetuity, we do it right. And that's a heck of a feather in our cap. It's a nice multiple, yeah. nice additional uh, revenue stream for the owners of the, of the farm property. And it ties us together with Hilton, Mahogany Bay, and the village. Yeah. And it's a great place. So for those of you out there who are investing with me, actually, David will be a business partner, right? So in all of the rooms that we own there will be chocolate from David's company. So that's pretty exciting. So can you back up a little bit? Let's talk a little bit about the business model itself and how exactly you're doing this. If you were to do a global search and replace and take out the word coffee and put in the word cacao, you would have the business model. Right. Exactly the same as we're doing here. We buy underperforming cacao producing farms or vacant or raw land that's suitable for cacao same as we do in coffee. We buy those farms, then we improve those farms to turn them into a specialty cacao or a fine-flavored organic cacao that would allow us to produce our own cacao for chocolate and consumption by mahogany chocolate in the the village and to be sold by the trading company and to be sold by the farming company, probably through the trading company. So it's the same model of taking the underperforming farm and turning it into a very well oiled specialty producer of agricultural product, non-perishable agricultural product, importantly, which is uh, cacao. We then subdivide those farms once we buy them into half-acre parcels, offer those parcels to individual owners who can then be part of a producing cacao farm. In this case, they own the land. It's a deeded property in a titled cacao farm in Belize, so they have the security of the land. For most America, for Americans, uh, that land is not reportable if it's held in your own name under the FATCA regulations. One of the very few assets that are not right. reportable. From there, it's it's turnkey managed, the same as we do in coffee here. So there's a management team in place that knows what they're doing. It's comprised of local Belizean people who are in the cacao business, comprised of native uh, Mayan people who are in the uh, traditionally in the cacao business since cacao was a currency way back in the old days. So the Na Lu Um Cacao Institute, which is a Mayan name for Mother Earth, is a group of uh, local indigenous Mayans that are working with us, partners with us. So we have the local side all tied yeah. up and taken care of. Yeah. So it's it's the same idea. And then we have the socially sustainable model built into it as well, where 20% of the revenues that come from the farms after the direct costs are handled as taken aside and put into an inviolate bonus pool which is solely used to improve the lives of the 
very impoverished cacao farmers, and in this case in Belize, they're subsistence farmers. They have on average 1.5 acres of land for their family. They grow cacao on that and sell the cacao and live on very small amounts of money. Yeah. So effectively, um, you're taking land that's poorly performing. People are, you know, not using it well enough to create enough cash flow off of it. You're buying it and then putting people back to work, you know, giving them a better life and in the process developing more chocolate and better chocolate and making a profit. So it's a socially sustainable, positive impact type of investment. And as you mentioned, again, it's it's land. So one of the things that also interesting about this is that in order to invest in the Hilton and the Belize uh, Hilton that, you know, that I'm raising money for, on that side, you have to be an accredited investor, but you don't have to be a accredited investor here because you're not investing in a fund. You're actually buying land. Isn't that correct? That's exactly true. You're buying half an acre or more in real estate parcel, real estate purchases. It's a real estate opportunity. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's certainly, for those of you who are disappointed about not being able to get involved in the Hilton, that's another opportunity for you, obviously that, and, and the coffee as well. Now, let's talk about, you alluded to it a little bit before with the cacao global market, and it's really big. Now, who's eating it? Is there an expanding horizon of countries eating chocolate? And is there a way to sort of track the way chocolate spreads, the way coffee does? And, you know, coffee obviously seems to follow this wherever the world starts to get more developed and so, you know, quote unquote, westernized, you know, coffee goes there and it becomes sort of a social thing, right? So what about chocolate? Chocolate follows a lot of the same patterns. It's about the same size of a business. It's a, currently a $98 billion, with a B, industry worldwide. It's a bigger business than a lot of people really think uh, when you start to think about chocolate. Gourmet chocolate is the big deal. In the United States of America, Germany, crazy places like Romania and other places that consume vast amounts of chocolate yeah. in their diets, which is surprising to me. But all over the world, that gourmet tendency is being followed and developed like in coffee people are they just want better quality they want to know where it came from they want to know who picked it and what day and was it raining or not they want a profile of the coffee they want a profile of the chocolate they want to know what's going into their food they're fussy they can afford it and so therefore they're paying exorbitant numbers for gourmet chocolate because they want it and that business is got no boundaries whatsoever as as developing nations come along there will be room for much less expensive but higher quality chocolate bars and that there's a huge opportunity just in chocolate bars never mind in bonbons and truffles and and all of the uh, very high ganache and the very high end chocolate products that people will pay for example 90 euro uh, for three truffles in belgium in a store how do you make sure that you've got the right kind of chocolate? I mean, I don't know that much, obviously, about chocolate, but how does something become gourmet? Well, it's generally the source of the bean. The yeah. bean itself is the critical part. And it's, mm-hmm. there's fine flavor and organic cacao, and then there's commercial cacao. And Ivory Coast and those other places are all commercial cacao. We're not interested in that business. That's all bought up and, and mixed together into a chocolate bar made by Hershey's and sold as a around the world for whatever it goes for. The same as Folgers would mix co- uh, you know, commercial coffee and sell it at five bucks a can. That's not our business. But the fine... Belize has developed over the years a very strong worldwide reputation for fine flavored and or organically grown and developed cacao. And that reputation is where you back into if you're in the gourmet business. And there are gourmet chocolate makers around the world that only buy from Belize, or they might buy from Belize, Dominican Republic, Peru, and Ecuador, places where there's smaller quantities grown, but they're high quality. And then, of course, our executive chocolatier, Josh Parker, who has just finished relocating to Belize this week uh, to run the store and handle all of the mahogany chocolate side of the business, backs his way down right into the farm. And he's on the farm with the farmers, cutting down the pods, checking the pods and the, and the seeds inside the pods, immediately off the tree, when they're dried, when they're fermented first, and when they're dried and they're cut and they're tasted and they're managed all the way through the line all the way up to that finely produced uh, ganache-filled truffle that's on your pillow in the the Hilton at the Mahogany Bay. So that's where the gourmet side comes in. And not only do we 
have this worldwide growth that's going on in this product, a gourmet chocolate, but just old little old Belize itself, a country sure. of 365,000 people, but has a huge demand for chocolate products in the country, not huge by American standards or anything, but huge for them, 500 metric tons of chocolate, 565 metric tons of chocolate are, are, are required each year in various forms in the country, whether it's cacao powder for baking or nibs or, or cacao butter or whatever, chocolate bars or you name it, the whole gamut. And they can only provide 15 metric tons of that themselves. Mm -hmm. They import all of the rest. Good. So there's a balance of payments issue going on here that we can even help with. Yeah, sure. Now, can you give us some sense? I know it's it's hard to do this because it's a new project, but you mentioned how close you got with the pro forma on the coffee there. What does something look like in terms of this and in, in terms of returns, IRR, internal rate of return over, say, 20 years or whatever? What kind of returns should people be thinking about? Did exactly the same modeling as we did in coffee. Mm -hmm. It's working. We used a 20-year slice, as you suggested, uh, of time to create the cash flows. This time, we have multiple revenue streams. There will be coffee, or um, there will be cacao being produced on the farm at the farm level. So there's the farming income. There's the trading business, which the owners of the property will participate in the profits of that revenue stream. And mahogany chocolate, which we've talked about at length, will also have. They will also participate in the revenue stream from that. So there's three different revenue streams to, in this in this case. Model those numbers based on what we expect from each of them over a 20-year period with an appropriate discount rate for the risk. And uh, we've come up with an 11% IRR, or for those not familiar with that term, an average annual yield, if you want, of 11%. There will be a capital gain proponent uh, for the property as well, which can be counted uh, additionally, but we try to keep that to yeah. as low a low as number as possible, something sure. below for four percent sure. a year or something just to reflect inflation so that's the stream the modeling's the same three right. revenue streams irr 11 percent starts slowly like everything else when you're turning around nature when would you expect distributions i know with coffee it was a couple of years so yeah the first distributions in cacao should be within 12 to 15 months of you acquiring your parcel Got it. because the revenue streams from chocolate mahogany chocolate and from the trading company will kick in sooner than the farms whereas in coffee and it's all farms and takes a little longer to grow the trees but there are two other revenue streams will start to kick in earlier so you can expect something in the 12 to 15 month range and it'll grow slowly but climbs quite quickly because cacao can be grown on these farms in two to three years as opposed to the three or four or five that it takes in coffee so it's quicker yeah and there's no like expiration on the farms in other words these farms don't become obsolete over a period of time or become not fertile. I, I mean, I, I'm not a farmer, so I don't know. But can you give me a sense of sort of the longevity of those returns? Um, forever. Yeah. A good way to describe good. it. Good. <laughs> well, that's that's always the, good. The trees uh, are know what, know what to do every year. Nature right. takes care of all of that for us. They need a little help. And they don't get that help right now. Right. And so they're not producing as much as they could, both in coffee and in cacao, but particularly in cacao. I mean, people are, are the subsistence farming there is, is they're very shorter capital so simply maintaining the farm by pruning the trees is half the battle right uh, you prune the trees properly feed them maintain them properly they grow cacao every year year in year out for a long time a cacao tree can easily go 25 to 40 years and longer depending on how well maintained it is and then it's simply replaced the same way as it is in coffee with new seedlings and then they grow to a, produce a crop in about the year, third year and they peak out at about year five and they continue staying at peak until 20 or 30 years later if you keep them maintained properly so we can keep the farms in perpetuity it becomes a legacy investment for people for their for their families families currently and for their heirs down the road. There's absolutely no reason in the world that anybody should be buying in and selling out anytime soon. We don't encourage anybody to come in uh, uh, with less than a five to seven year time yeah. horizon. And if they do want to, you can sell if you wanted to. How does that work? Yeah, you can, it's your land. So you can sell the land. And of course, if you sell the land, the other revenue streams go away. Right. But you can do that. It's your land. Um, right. And you can do that to a third party. We have a first right of refusal on that property, which, uh, of course, we're going to exercise because we want to keep sure. 
we don't want you to sell your land to a Chinese sock manufacturer. Right. You know, that's going to upset our farm. So we'll be buying it back from you. The market price is probably what we're selling the parcels for. So the, you know, you as time that goes, time goes on, that'll get higher and higher. And so there should be a easily established transaction between us. And that's what can happen. You know, failing that, uh, sell it to uh, any third party you want. You have that right after the 30 days first right of refusal from us uh, to anybody. And we would assist you doing that if we didn't buy it ourselves right to another owner or another investor or somebody that owns the parcel next door to you or whatever you know? right but we cert- certainly don't encourage that yeah now you described this particular investment as low risk why do you call it low risk well particularly because of the product it's a proven product so we're not building a widget in silicon valley that nobody knows whether it's going to be taken up or uh, by the public or not so we got a proven product we have a, a proven market proven pricing proven distribution the whole product side of the business is secure, established, understandable, and not rocket science. Maybe cacao science, but not rocket science. On top of that, you own the land. So you have a secure asset that you can touch and taste and feel as your security behind the program. So we consider the business risk is low because of the country and the democracy and the law, British common law, and the fact that it was British Honduras and all the rest of that, the financial risk is low because we don't have any leverage. Right. So right. it's equity. And yeah. so there's the calling, uh, coming, knocking on the door, making, raining on your parade. <laughs> yeah. So, and they're pooling revenue. So there's just some averaging effects there. And right. obviously owning land is one of the ways that we know to hedge inflation and that sort of thing. You know, we have listeners from around the world, but we have a sense, I mean, there's not a lot of you know, Belize tends to be a very good place for taxes in general. Do you have any comments on how that might work in terms of, say, well, primarily, let's just focus on Americans. That makes up still probably about 85% of my audience. Americans who are taxed worldwide on their income. Yeah. Yeah. Nice privilege for holding that passport. Right. But the reporting side, as I said earlier, is not there. Uh, they are the fat cat regulations. You don't need to report real estate, foreign real estate held in your own name. So right. the reporting issue is, is moot. Um, tax is your own issue. You're responsible to pay your taxes to your government, and the American government collects 10% world, on your worldwide income. So you should declare that to Uncle Sam and, and pay your taxes. I think farming income in the U.S., I'm not a tax expert and one of, would not want to be held out to be one, but I think the others have told me that there's a schedule in the states in the U.S. that you can apply for a lower rate of tax on your income because it's farming right. income. So there's something to do with that. But other than that, it's the same as coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we can all figure that out as we need to do anyway. So as part of the due diligence process. Now, if we want to learn more about this opportunity, David, how do we get a hold of you? How do we find out more? Simply go to the website. And on the website, there is a full description of everything, the parcels, the, the, the properties that we bought. We have already bought three properties of about 107 acres, which we're subdividing now for this program. So all that description is there. All of the information you need is there. All of the information about the mahogany chocolate company and its operations and the five-star kitchen that we've developed in Mahogany Bay, filled completely to the brim with brand new Italian chocolate making equipment and pictures and photos and all of the information you're going to need there to familiarize yourself is there. Go to the Getting Started button on the same website, click on that, a little landing page. You'll have to put up a little picture of me for a few minutes and read that, fill in your information and send it to us and automatically you will get an introductory email which explains the program and you'll get a 16-page four-color brochure that is in the form of an FAQ that will answer virtually all your questions. Every question we've ever been asked, uh, we've tried to answer in that booklet so that you get most of your due diligence done just by going to the getting started button, filling in your information and pushing the button. And then you'll get automatically over the next few days, a couple of more emails that are continuing to explain the nuances of the program and how it works. So that's all your due diligence information. Once you've got that point and you want to go further ahead and you contact us, because we will not be contacting you, you come and talk to us. And if you want to ask us questions, we'll answer any more questions you may have. If you want to go further, we have a non-disclosure agreement as we require before we hand out the proprietary goodies. And that includes the purchase agreement, which is a whole two pages long. And the oper- the ownership agreement is very short as well. And the pro forma financials for you to really dig into the numbers. 
So if you're at that stage and you want to contact us after you've got the information off the Getting Started button on the website, please do so. Hmm. And the website is www.belizecacaoconsortium.com. What's the minimum uh, investment on here? $24,500 for one parcel. Got it. Got it. So it's very accessible. David, listen, You uh, thank you very much for being on the show. You are doing great work as usual. Thank you very much, Buck. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with your listeners. Now, listen, folks, you have seen you know now several opportunities over the last few months for you to invest in real assets. And some of them are in the U.S. and some abroad, and some are real estate related and some not. But it's time to start thinking about your own investing philosophy and taking action. So I encourage you to reach out to folks like David. By the way, there are limited parcels on this chocolate. So I don't think this is going to last as long as the coffee. So if you are interested in that, get in touch with him as soon as possible. If that's not up your alley, there's plenty of things we've been talking about. So make sure you also go to wealthformula.com. If you are an accredited investor, you can sign up for the Investor Club. We'll continue to have opportunities there, just like the one David had here, except, you know, the nice thing about David's is you don't have to be an accredited investor. So that's it for me. Until next week, this is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.